the alkali metals. Now, after we take a look from the periodic table, we know the alkali metals is actually the group one in the periodic table. Let's take a look. It starts from lithium, Li, sodium, Na, dashium, K, rubidium, Rb, cesium, Cs, and tritium, Fr. Out of all of these elements, only tritium is the one that is radioactive. So we'll discuss least and we'll discuss rest of the, the most. The elements in group one are alkali metals. Tritium is radioactive. Uh, the isotopes are very short-lived and scientists predict that very small amount is present. So we are going to go with the rest of it as said over here. Physical properties, let's take a look. If you see uh, and try to find out a pattern, you would see the melting point is decreasing down the group as well as the boiling point, but the density increases down the group. This is for group one. Remember melting point and boiling point are decreasing. However, the density is increasing if you go from top to bottom in a group. Moving on. Now, uh, density has to increase, but that's not regular. And sodium and potassium are less dense than water, so they will float on it. Elements, these metals are very soft. By soft, I mean they can be cut with a knife and softer as you move down the group. They're shiny, silver gray in appearance when freshly cut, but they tarnish very quickly upon exposure to air. Tarnish means they are going to corrode and change color. That's what it means. So usually their silver gray appearance turns to dark gray or gray black as soon as they tarnish and that's because they reaction to oxygen. Uh, as soon as they're freshly cut, anything any of the ugly metals will react with oxygen to form their respective oxides. And that can be balanced like this. This is one of the reactions. We're going to consider the reactions like two. Now moving on, handling and storage. All these metals are extremely reactive and get more reactive as you go down the group. They quickly react with oxygen in their form oxide, as I explained earlier. They also react rapidly with water and form strongly alkaline solutions of metal hydroxides. That's why group one are commonly known as alkali metals. To stop them reacting with oxygen or water vapor in the air, lithium, sodium, and potassium are stored under oil. Rubidium and cesium are so reactive, they have to be stored in sealed glass tubes to stop any possibility of oxygen getting in them. Great care must be taken not to touch any of these metals with bare fingers. Uh, there could be any, enough sweat on your skin to give a reaction and producing lots of heat in a very corrosive metal hydroxide that can easily eat up your skin. Now, moving on with some more important information. Two reasons to put these elements in group one. They have one electron in their outermost shell. Now this represents the electron in their outermost shell. And as you see, the numbers are one. Second most important reason, they have chemical, chemical properties. They all react with water and form a hydroxide with the formula MOH, M is the metal, which means LiOH, N LiOH, NaOH, so on and so forth. Plus they'll produce hydrogen. We'll discuss this reaction in detail later. They react with oxygen to form oxides and the formula are M2O, as I've explained one reaction, Na2O or K2O or how they form. They also react with halogens to form compounds and usually the formula is MX. For example, one atom of any one of these alkali metals and one atom of any one of the halogens. So that's MX, X means halogen and M means the alkali metal. So lithium chloride or potassium bromide are good examples. They form ionic compounds uh, which contain M positive ion, for example, Na positive or K positive, both of these contains these ions. So this is the same example discussed over here, however, in terms of bonding. Moving on, the chemical properties actually depend upon the number of electrons in the outer shell. The group one elements react in very similar ways because they all have same number of electrons in the outer shell, one. So reason two is just really a consequence of reason one. Moving on, reactions with water. Let's study their reactions in detail. It's very simple that alkali metal would react with water, would form a metal hydroxide and would produce hydrogen. The reaction would stay the same. 
So with sodium, it's going to be just replace this M with sodium, it becomes a reaction with sodium, replace this M with potassium, it becomes a reaction with potassium, so on and so forth. The reaction with water is very typical. It actually can float on water because of having low density uh, white rail form, which dissolves in the water. That is this alkali. And lastly, it produces hydrogen and hydrogen can catch fire easily. So we get a little bit of that firework. Now the main observations which you can make Sodium floats because of being less dense than air, explained already. Sodium melts into a ball because the melting point is low and a lot of heat is produced by the reaction. Then there is fizzing because the gas is being produced, hydrogen. The sodium moves around in the surface of water because hydrogen is given up symmetrically around the ball. The sodium is pushed around the surface of the water like a hovercraft. The piece of sodium gets smaller and eventually disappears because sodium is used up in the reaction, converted into alkali and hydrogen. And lastly, if you test the solution that is found with universal indicator, and you would see that the color goes blue, predicting that it produces an alkaline solution having OH negative ions. Now, we can always use the word fizzing for the gas produced, but you may write bubbling or pervescence whatever you actually see. And this all means almost the same. Lithium reacts in the same way, but uh, the observations are a little different. Lithium produces the same compounds, so does potassium, but uh, in case of lithium, the reaction is similar to sodium, except it's slower. Lithium has melting point is higher and heat isn't produced so quickly, so lithium does not melt. In case of potassium, as it is, it has a lower position on the periodic table than sodium, so the reaction is actually faster. Enough heat is produced to ignite the sodium, which burns with a lilac flame, a little bit of purple. Lilac is mostly purple. The reaction of the, often ends with potassium split, spitting around and exploding. Remember, reaction of potassium is going to be more uh, vigorous than sodium. Rubidium and cesium, they react even more violently, even explosively. Rubidium hydroxide and cesium hydroxide are formed. Now, if you're going to compare, you're supposed to use such phrases which can differentiate them. For example, fizzes more vigorously, moves around more quickly, disappears more quickly, or stuff like that. Uh, remember, we went with a slow reaction in case of lithium, an adequate reaction in case of sodium, a faster reaction in case of potassium, a violent reaction in case of rubidium, and an explosive reaction in case of cesium. So using better adjectives can easily differentiate among all of them. Now explaining the increase in reactivity. When we say as we go down the group, the metals become more reactive, we need to explain that with the help of the metal structure. In all the reactions, the metal atoms are actually losing one electron, which is present in their outermost shell, and forming metal ions in solution. Now the difference between this reaction depends from metal to metal because their size is different. Let's consider the case of lithium and sodium in order to compare them. Now, how easily are uh, the outermost electron, that one single electron is lost in each case that depends upon how strongly it is attracted to the nucleus. In case of lithium, the size is smaller uh, for the atom. So the distance of this electron from the nucleus is less as compared to sodium. So in case of sodium, less attractive forces are experienced by the electron. It can be lost easier, more easier than as compared to lithium, which actually experiences more attraction from nucleus. Remember, nucleus contains protons, which are positive, and they're going to attract the electrons because electrons are negatively charged. So as we move down the group, actually more and more shells are added to the structure of the atom. Lithium is smallest, sodium is bigger than lithium, potassium is bigger than sodium. The list goes on, cesium being the biggest one in this case, non-radioactive ones, of course. So the outer electron is lost easily, more easily as you go down the group, which makes this reaction more and more reactive. Now, if you talk about the water, what happens with the water is that 
as soon as they lose electrons, the electrons are gained by water like this. The electrons lost by alkali metals are gained by water and hence the water is converted into hydroxide ions and hydrogen. That hydrogen catches fire which makes the reaction explosive and specifically the metals present down below in the group and all of them react instantly with this hydroxide forming the alkalis. Let's move on. Now the reactions of alkali metal with the air. Lithium, sodium, and potassium are all stored in oil because they react with the air. If we look at the piece of sodium taken out of the oil, it usually has a crust on the outside. It is not shiny unless it has been freshly cut. When the piece of sodium is cut, the fresh surface is shiny because uh, it tarnishes rapidly as the freshly exposed sodium reacts with oxygen in the air. Now, if we do the same with a piece of lithium, it tarnishes slowly than sodium. If you do the same with potassium, it is going to rapidly uh, tarnish, which means that sodium is more reactive than lithium, but potassium is more reactive than both. Now, in this case, the reaction of oxygen in the air results in the formula M2O, which means we're going to form Na2O or Li2O or K2O respectively if we are going to react them with oxygen or let them tarnish. So these are the respective formulae, but they all burn in different ways as they show a separate flame, red color of flame for lithium, yellow color of flame for sodium and lilac for potassium. The reaction, however, would be similar in all the cases. And the products formed are white powders, uh, which are alkali metal oxides. Now let's discuss the compounds of alkali metals. All group one metals ions are colorless. That means their compounds will be colorless or white until they are combined with a colored negative ion. Potassium dichromate is orange because dichromate ion is orange. Potassium manganate is purple because the manganate ion is purple. Potassium, however, is still colorless in its ions. Group one compounds are typical ionic solids and are mostly soluble in water. So summarizing the main features, group one elements are metals, are soft, can be cut with a knife, with low melting points and densities, which are low for uh, these metals if they're compared with the rest of the metals of the periodic table. They are, have to be stored out of contact with air or water because they're going to react with both. They react rapidly with air to form the coatings of metal oxide. They react with water to produce an alkaline solution of the metal hydroxide and hydrogen gas. This reaction is vigorous in cases of uh, elements present down the group. In their increase in reactivity as you go down the group, they all form the compounds in which metal has plus one ion, specifically ionic bonds, uh, compounds, and have mainly white or colorless compounds which dissolve to produce colorless solutions, which means they're mostly soluble in water. At least their salts are. Now, predicting the properties of francium uh, when in comparison with the rest of the group, francium is extremely radioactive. And nobody has actually seen a piece of francium. So, what we can predict, it's very soft. It will have a melting point around room temperature. It would have a density probably just over two grams per cubic centimeter, which is extremely, uh, which is high in the case of if all of these metals are compared, but still is a very low density if compared with the rest of the periodic table. It's a silvery metal. It would tarnish almost instantly in air. It would react violently with water to give francium hydroxide and hydrogen. The reaction would be extremely explosive because it's more reactive than cesium. It will have a hydroxide, francium hydroxide with the formula FROH, which would be soluble in water and form an extremely uh, strongly alkaline solution. And its compound would be white or colorless, which would dissolve in water to give colorless solutions. Now, if we tend to use the graphical method to predict the melting point of francium, and we plot the melting point of almost all the metals, it's easy to get a better idea. So if we carry the line, uh, we can predict the melting point of about 22 degrees centigrade. That's why the line of having a melting point around room temperature.
Remember, these are all predictions. Various other predictions give a melting point of francium between 21 and 27 degrees centigrade. We chose the easiest method to give the, or to predict the melting point of francium. That's about it. Thank you.